Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the final Urban Living webinar of the year. And today we are looking ahead to 2023, and we're going to be discussing some trends that we think might resonate across the hospitality and real estate spaces next year. My name is George Sell. I'm editor of Urban Living News, and we're a multimedia platform for the hospitality and real estate sectors. And uh, these are a few pictures of, a, of an event which we held a few days ago where uh, myself and my colleagues in editorial, Paul Stevens and Eloise Hansen, we shared uh, a sneak preview of, of this series of trends webinars that we're doing for all our brands across the week. Um, and that, that was kind of uh, kicking off the Christmas season for us really. That was our, our first event, which was, which was a lot of fun. So uh, today's session, we are uh, going to talk about six trends. I'm going to present three of them. And then for the other three, we're going to have a Q&A with the gentleman you can see on your screen there. And as we get to their uh, respective sections, I'll ask them to introduce themselves briefly before we crack on with those. The webinar will last an hour. If you have any questions for our panel, please submit them using the Q&A function in Zoom. Uh, and if you've got a, a question that's pertinent to a particular trend that we're discussing, then please do send it through while we're talking about that one and we'll try and get around to answering them. And everybody who has registered for today's session will receive a recording via email, a, a link to a recording via email in the next few days. Now this webinar has been sponsored by Lavanda, which provides award-winning PMS solutions since 2015. Lavanda is the next generation technology for stays of any length, and it works across the student accommodation, multifamily, co-living and service department sectors. So let's crack on with our first trend. And for this one, we can find out a little bit more about Lavanda because we've got the company's CEO with us. So Fred, if you'd like to uh, introduce yourself quickly, and then we'll, we'll talk about this first trend, which is about, it's, uh, essentially about co-living and build to rent in the same development, but we can probably widen the conversation to talk about other uses as well. So um, if you'd like to quickly introduce yourself, Fred. Yeah, sure. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Fred. Uh, I'm Fred Lackenbaugh. I'm the CEO of Lavanda. Um, and as George mentioned, we are the uh, preeminent uh, flexible living technologies platform uh, with a PMS that is focused on stays of any length and the flexibility within the modern kind of consumer experience that people want. Thanks, Fred. So the reason I've put this trend in is because I think, although this is starting to happen, I still think that some operators are missing a trick here, particularly with the cost of living crisis biting. Um, there's a lot of really nice build to rent inventory out there and it's um, for its target audience, it's, it's very good but it's quite expensive, some of it. And I think that the, um, the operational skill sets involved in co-living and build to rent are similar enough that you could offer um, both use classes in the same building and you could, you could widen your audience because co-living is obviously at a slightly lower price point. So you could have a few, a few floors of perhaps um, smaller units and, and, and slightly more communal facilities rather than the larger units associated with, with build to rent. So Fred, am I barking completely up the wrong tree or are you starting to see this kind of thing of multiple uses in, in the same building in new projects? Yes, yeah, it's, it's a great question. Um, we are absolutely seeing this. Now, of course, building and construction takes a very long time and can't react necessarily to the cha changes in trend in the market. But within co-living, um, co-living has changed an awful lot in the, in the last uh, couple of years, let alone from when it started. I, I'd argue if you asked, you know, 10 people in the industry what co-living meant, you'd probably get 10 different answers even today. Yeah. Um, and I think some of the really notable big co-living players that were making great strides in forming that as a certain thing e.g. kind of like the collective, when they when some of those businesses either went bust or the model didn't turn out to be quite what they wanted it to be, that changed the, the landscape quite a lot. So co-living now, from what we see, is very different. Co-living is um, a lot of small startups who are focused uh, not necessarily on um, buildings where um, you're kind of squeezing the space down to an absolute minimum, which was some of the critique, I think, of a, an, a maybe let's say an earlier version of co-living but actually just being much more about 
um, positioning it at, at, at a type of person who's between student and multifamily. So it's a, it's a demographic play. And then wrapping around thematic uh, community ideas. So for example, small buildings that might be targeting kind of artist community or engineering community or young professionals. One super cool one we met recently who's in um, Dubai is doing one about um, founders and entrepreneurs and business, effectively young business people, because in that, in that, in that uh, uh, culture, it's quite tricky for individuals who don't know each other to meet other individuals outside of sort of family ties and things. So working in, in the same building together um, is actually quite attractive. So when you're thinking of more of it as a branding and you don't necessarily need to be quite as physically limited, you can absolutely attract different audiences with different brands. And we're seeing this a lot in Europe now. So uh, for example, one of our partners in, in, in Greystar in Spain has effectively got one building with, with multiple sort of sub brands attracting different audiences with then segmented floors and rooms to those different audiences. And just uh, tweaking the pricing and the proposition and maybe the um, commitment level in terms of you know length and tenure and everything else to better suit that audience um, and to your point you know my bugbear for years has been everything's kind of inverted commas being built for bankers I'm, I'm allowed to say that because I, I used to work in finance um, yeah. but everything is being built for a very very expensive segment and there's just only so many of them and frankly you're not really solving any material problem, right? If you're if you're not addressing the mid market, but of course, developers need to green light projects and make returns. And you know, I don't live in a, in, a, in, a, in a in a sort of totally ideological mindset with that. But if you can cleverly segment your building into different use cases to still achieve the yield that unlocks the asset and the returns needed, you can also then address different price points and market segmentations, such as you know a twenty three year old whatever in the workforce who who needs to kind of figure out their way forward. Um, and I think also what's really interesting is, and we're seeing this in the student transition, I, I don't know any big operator that isn't thinking about multiple, you know, co-living and built multifamily or student and multifamily, but also what it allows you to do is extend the uh, diversification of your target audience as well, because, yeah. you know, going into recessionary climate, trends are changing, some student buildings are super oversubscribed, but then the debt level of students is really high, you know, it allows you to weather uh, we call them all turning them into all weather assets, but by attracting different types of people, you can create a more natural defensibility in the in the building as well. Yeah, I, I saw something this morning actually that was quite interesting. Dexter Moran, the, the architect, has, has written a piece in Property Week about what he calls planning apartheid, which is the kind of yeah. demarcation of one use class from another. But does does planning have implications in what we're talking about? Are the planners up to speed with this kind of flexible usage? No, I mean, absolutely not. It's a complete nightmare. And like, I think the, I think some people have got away with this with using the, the generic class, but even that has, that has problems. Um, and, and converting one to another is difficult. There is still quite a, a, an old fashioned valuation market as well. You've got to be quite careful about, you know, you, you don't want to mess up the valuation and end up on a wrong cap rate if, you, if you're playing too many games. Um, and I think to some extent, oddly, there are certain European markets that seem to have for various like local political reasons managed to cut through some of that um, to generate large scale developments. So I, personally, I'm seeing more of the kind of exciting stuff happening in Europe, which is very frustrating, you know, that, it, that not more of it's happening here. Um, but the reality is you need a complete reshuffle of the cards, which I don't think is, you know, on the agenda, sadly, but you do because you, in order to be able to flexibly take a building. So for example, there's one set of buildings that, that we're working with in Europe, two and a half thousand units. It has everything from short stay hotel to long term tenants. It has a multifamily student and co-living in one, and it can basically move floors between that. And the only reason they can do that is because of the planning allowances like that. That project would almost almost be impossible in, in the UK, but it has greenlit a super exciting um, set of assets, a huge amount of development in the market um, and help bring a load of uh, uh, inventory at large scale buildings, which helps, you know, some of the challenging um, build numbers that we have in the UK. So yeah, very, very difficult. Um, and I think that's why people pay premiums in a sense for assets where there's more flexibility or there's a lot of developers who are trying to move assets from one class to another or, or to achieve more uh, uh, flexibility within it in order to increase the value. Yeah, yeah, okay. Fred, what are the main operational challenges involved in serving these different markets in the same building? I mean, you, you obviously supply technology that, that helps people to do that, but how can the sort of building design help to address those challenges? 
I think uh, I think quite a lot. I think um, in my head, there's kind of three categories. There's technology, there's people, which is often not actually talked about enough. And then there's this physicality of the building. And technology, I actually think has got come a long way. Companies like ourselves, there's also a whole world of small companies that can achieve your, if you use an open API platform like ourselves, you can then you know, add in little uh, uh, small solutions to kind of paint the picture that you want to express the building that you want in the market, whether that's some really specific community module or some sort of like vetting module on, on, on the thing. So technology has kind of come a long way. I think people has also come a long way. Many of the big operators across uh, built around Colima student are now um, actively hiring from the hotel industry, thinking a lot about hospitality. Um, they may not have that many staffing, but they're kind of, I would argue, investing a lot more in those in the in the people and making sure that they uh, find this achievable. They do need the technology to drive down those requirements. Otherwise, it's you know you're, you're never really going to get there. But the buildings, I would say, are are are, are lagging quite a lot. And and I think it, it's just a, a virtue of the fact that it's a long cycle, right? It's some of the stuff coming out of the ground today was envisaged quite a long while ago, where things all this terminology is different, the use case is different. Um, so I I think it's quite a challenge. But I think there are some real basics around how entry is access to the building. Um, the, the one that's always super frustrating is, is key access. I know it sounds really simple. It seems slightly insane in 2022 to be talking about whether that is fully virtualized or not. But yeah, there are still plenty of buildings that are coming out the ground now with key locks, which is a mm -hmm. incredibly inflexible technology when you're trying to be efficient and, and work through, work around the building. Um, I mean, luckily, like hyper hyper fast broadband and everything else is now is now standard but there there is still a lot that can be done but at least between co-living and btr or co-living and student there isn't a huge uh, physicality needed as long as you're not playing massive games on the uh, unit space so i would say that that is a problem where some buildings you know not to be critical but there are some markets where huge amounts of two beds have gone into the market right and a very specific size of, of unit so that's quite problematic if you're then going to try and do co-living and others but if a building has a spectrum of unit sizes then it can be quite flexible. But if it's all gone studio, all gone three bed, then it's quite tricky to, to do stuff later on. Yeah, yeah, okay. Fred, in the US, we're, we're starting to see this movement that, uh, that people are calling vertical villages, where you're seeing really big mis mixed use developments with uh, multiple residential tenures. Uh, you've also got leisure space, you've got office space, you've got F&B, all in one building. How close are we seeing how close are we to seeing that concept come into Europe and the UK? I think the intent is extremely high now. Um, we work largely with global partners like, you know, Brookfield or Greystar or Blackstone and others like this. So they very much want to bring that model to market. But you are constrained by a number of things. So planning, which we've already talked about, is an issue. Uh, physical land plot size is another issue. You know, if you happen to be building in a market or, or converting in a market where the physical land asset size is only so much, there's a, there is a limit to what you're going to deploy into that. But we have seen, um, I would say, particularly in Iberia, so kind of Spain in, in particular, there is a very high appetite for uh, these kind of bigger projects where you're really creating a, a, a community. Um, I mean, even I, sp I spent a week in Madrid uh, a couple of weeks ago, visiting a lot of different assets, clients and partners, uh, went around some incredible student assets, for example, where frankly, there were restaurants and, you know, uh, swimming pools and it just really, it was a little mini, you know, city. Um, and I think if you can get the scale, then you can kind of do that. Um, and Brookfield has a sub -com company, uh, uh, Eclair has an amazing one in, in Paris, on the outskirts of Paris, 1500 yeah. beds, Palazzo. Yeah, I think, I think you guys seen, did a tour. Yeah, it was great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and like, that's, a city, that's a small city, right? 1500 uh, 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 rooms, that's probably about 3000 occupants. You know, it's, it's absolutely massive. So um, there you can really start to address some of this stuff. Um, I think retail is the one I've seen less of. So let's slightly less ambitious. I mean, when I say retail, I mean in the American style of retail. So less of a kind of shopping mall style, um, but definitely F and B, definitely leisure bars, etc., and small scale uh, retail seems to be pretty standard. And just generally making sure that you can maximize the, the revenue out of the assets. So often parking is a, is a big thing in Europe than it is certainly in the UK. Um, so all of those kind of revenue streams being able to be uh, done on one scale means that the overall fund can get bigger, the returns can get bigger, and you can kind of 
progress that unlock and build cycle, which is which is very valuable. Yeah, great stuff. Thanks very much, Fred. That was some um, fascinating stuff there. If you want to carry on the conversation with Fred, you can see his LinkedIn profile in the chat. So please do drop him a line. Uh, we're going to move on to our second trend now, which I'm just going to talk you through. And this is called conversions galore as planners and the cost of construction stifle new build projects. <clears throat> so in London and other cities, we've seen what's been a fairly rapid shift in mindset from planners. They're now very reluctant to give consent for buildings to be demolished when they could be repurposed. And this is largely due to the embedded carbon they contain. Uh, rises in costs across the board in the development process, so more expensive labour, higher materials costs, more expensive borrowing, they've all made the process more expensive. Uh, on one of our recent Urban Living webinars, Andrew Fowler of Eden said the company is looking at um, more conversions in the future as the finances of some of the new build projects it was looking at have, have made them unviable. And I think this is going to be a common theme across the board next year. Um, just last month, we saw in Ireland, where there is a serious shortage of student housing, University College Dublin has shelved plans to build more than 1,200 PBSA units on its campus, uh, as the development was simply no longer financially viable due to rising construction costs. So new build is going to become more problematic, but there will be lots of opportunities. Uh, changing behaviours in the high street, changing ways of working, mean that there'll be an increasing number of office and retail units up for conversion, along with some, uh, some other more interesting opportunities in hospitality, for example, which has been quite innovative. We've seen everything from prisons, courthouses and castles converted into hotels. So we might see a, a few left field conversions too. But if you, if you look at the slides that we're showing here, these are some of the more, um, more typical ones that you'll see. So, um, Bottom right there, the Marks and Spencer one, retail to PBSA, um, an office building to PBSA in the middle. Um, the Hudson Hotel in New York is an interesting one. Uh, that's been repurposed into a co-living development, but I don't think that needed a huge amount of work because as a colleague of mine who once stayed there said the rooms are tiny, so I don't think the floor plan needed too much adjustment there. But there's a lot going on, and, and I dare say this time next year, um, we'll have some more examples to, uh, of this sort of um, conversion to show. So on to trend number three, and this is uh, chiming in with, with one of the trends we spoke of, uh, one of the things I mentioned there, and this is how the way we are working has changed and the implications that has for initially for workspace, but also for um, residential development as well as people are working so much more from home. So, um, Anthony, welcome to you. Thank you for joining us. Um, apologies for the misspelling on the slide there. There's no H in Anthony. So if you do want to visit Anthony's website, um, then it's A-N-T-O-N-Y. Um, Anthony, just want to quickly introduce yourself and then, then we'll get into the questions. I've got a feeling you might be on mute, Anthony. That's funny. I, I hardly ever mute myself, so I always, always get caught out when I do. Um, a, a long, long story short, uh, for 20 plus years I ran uh, software companies, always focused on the office, office market, principally around uh, property, management, property management systems. Um, mm -hmm. uh, did a number, number of them. Uh, the main, main one I did with uh, uh, Borgate Estates, Called vicinity, which was a very early um, inc incarnation of property management. Come costs with um, ten, what well, it's now known as ten, tenant engagement. Um, so I did that for 20, 20 odd years. The last last number of years, increasingly, um, what I what I do now is I advise um, I advise startups, landlords, and institutions essentially on future of work, future of offices, and my hobby horse, which is a thing called space, space, as, a, space as a service. And um, I, write, I write quite a lot, do quite a lot of speaking, and I run an online course called Space as a Service, the trillion dollar hashtag. Go to trilliondollarhashtag.com next cohort in, uh, in February. All, all about what's, what are we gonna be doing with um, our office buildings? Yeah, excellent. Thanks, Anthony. 
So um, perhaps you could encapsulate for us in a few sentences how the pandemic has accelerated the shifts that were already happening in the way people with office based jobs are working. Yeah, sure. I, th I think an interesting starting point on this is, um, is that word accelerated. So there's a lot of talk about how it's accelerated trends that were in existence before. But I actually think it's a, it's a lot more fundamental than that. I think the, what is going on is actually more like a revolution than an, than an acceleration. A lot of the trends that were existing before have been sped up, but they still would have taken 10, 15 years to get to the stage we are now. Because we learned two, two absolutely fundamental zeitgeist changing things during, during COVID. The, the, number one, the number one is that bad environmental conditions can kill us. What, we, what we've known for a long time, but now people are really co cognizant of, if you go into a, put a lot of people in a building with bad ventilation and introduce an airborne virus, and very bad things can in, ensue, ensue from that. Even if they don't kill you, it can seriously damage um, productivity because environmental conditions are directly linked to co cognitive function. And bottom line is if you put someone in really good environmental conditions, they are able to operate at their maximum cognitive function. If you put them in less good environmental conditions, they, they, they aren't. But either way, the fundamental point that having known it for decades, we are actually paying a lot more attention to their environmental con conditions now. And the second absolutely zeitgeist changing um, thing that we've learned is that um, remote working fundamentally works. Yeah. Um, lots of office people don't want to sort of um, have yet, yet to fully accept that, but really for 70% of people and for most things, Remote working works perfectly well. We went from 95% knowledge workers working in offices in early 2020, and we moved, moved them all out of offices within a matter of uh, weeks and a, and a couple of months. And funnily enough, the world didn't stop, and um, things, things just carried on. Is remote working um, or working outside an office ideal for everything? Absolutely not. Is it ideal for everybody? Absolutely not. But it has fundamentally changed the dynamic of the industry in the sense that um, historically companies needed, with an emphasis on the word need, um, an office. That's where, they, that's where they all got together and that's where work, work, ha work happened. We've now changed to a market where people need to be made to want an office. And that fundamentally changes the dynamic of an industry. If you're in an industry where people need your product, you can behave in a very different way to one where you have to persuade them to, to want, want your product. So those two, those two dynamics have really fundamentally changed the way we approach, we approach offices. And it's, it's, it, it, it's sort of maybe makes me ch chuckle a bit that we are now, you know, at least a year into being opened up and everyone keeps saying, well, come the next spring or come the next quarter, everyone will be back in the office. And funny enough, it, it, it doesn't happen. And it's very interesting and very telling if you go into some, some cities, city like London, corporate offices are occupied, are occupied at roughly half of what they were before the, before the pandemic. And the dirty little secret has also become clear that they were only half occupied even before, before um, the, the, the pandemic. So really offices are being operated on roughly a quarter of, of what they're, they're capable of being. But if you look at the letting market and um, the uh, buildings that are selling, very high spec, very high quality buildings are what people want. And if you look at the occupation of the better flex operators, they're very busy. A number of them you can't even can't even get into, and a lot of the best oper flex operators are all looking to expand. If you just take the straight old product market fit, essentially the flex market, the space as a service market, has got product market fit, and traditional office has not got product market fit. So it's a it's not an acceleration. It's a, there's a revolutionary. Uh, punctured equilibrium, I think the biologists call it. This is a new world. Okay, so let's talk about what the flex operators are actually offering. 
um, and, and what they are doing that is making people, as you said earlier, want to come into the office and, and is how this could potentially be the blueprint for, you know, for all future office development. So what, what are these guys offering that wasn't there before they came along? Well, it, 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 work, it works at, at, at various levels and, they, and there's layers of this. It has to be said that the, 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 first, the first thing is all around flexibility, simple flexibility of the amount of space I need to take and therefore pay for under what, under what terms is a, a massive, massive difference. Every company wants more, more, more flexibility. But you then have people want flexibility of tenure, but they want flexibility of time. You know, our notions of what is a working day have, have different uh, differ now. You know, there's a lot of people who work who work early, um, maybe take the kids to school, pick the kids up in the afternoon, do some work in the afternoon, or it's a sunny day, go and play golf on a Thursday because I'll catch up on Sunday type thing. We've become much more fluid and flexible in, in our attitudes towards when, when we work. And then also there's the flexibility around the type of spaces that we need to do whatever the job to be done is that we are trying to do at any given any given time. So if you if you take if every individual has a range of tasks that they have, have have to do on an ongoing basis, in an ideal world, and this is the, the this is the second definition of space as a service, just to de define space as a service. Partly it's about space that's procured on an on-demand basis, but much more importantly, space as a service is does what it says on the tin. The idea of spaces that provide you with the services you need in order to do the job to be done you have to do as and when as and when you you need to do it so it's all a, about taking somebody's task and putting them in an environment in a space that is best suited for that task so if you you know have a meeting to do a big meeting a small meeting your quiet room quiet work you want to do brainstorming work each of these actually requires different types of different types of, of spaces and this is some something that everyone has realized that, that they want to, as well. You know, they don't want to just go back, back to an office to sit at a, a desk to do a multitude of different things. They want different environments for different, different, um, for different purposes and different jobs, jobs to be done. And so what, you, what, what, what you're finding is that the better flex operators are first set themselves up so that they can offer flexibility of tenure, flexibility of time and flexibility of, of, of spaces. That's, that's a sort of fundamental, fundamental thing. But then the layer on top of that is actually understanding wants, needs, and desires. So with your existing audience, your existing customers, what is it that they want? What do they need? What do they desire? What are their jobs to be done? And, either, and these change for different types of, in, different types of companies and different types of industries at different times of, times of their life cycle, what it is that they're trying to do. Or if you're opening a new space, what type of customer are you trying to attract? So to attract this type of customer, what type of user experience do I need to create for this customer? Now, this is a very, very different thing, uh, way of looking at the office market. Office market essentially used to be you build a, a prime new building, you do exactly what the BCO tell you, and there's your building. And it's the same for everybody. This flex world, the space as a service world, is much more deliberately saying, I am not looking to attract everybody. I am looking to attract this audience. And this audience, I'm going to really understand this audience. I'm going to understand what their wants, needs, and desires are, what their jobs are to, to be done are. And I'm going to design a customer experience and a user experience that's right, that's right for the right for them. So the, the, the whole flex market, the whole space as a service market is doing the heretical thing within commercial real estate of starting with the customer and, and working everything, everything back from there. Because historically, the office market, the customer of an office building has actually been not the occupiers of a building, it's actually been investors. Yeah. You design a building around what investors want. So to get something funded or to sell it, Investors have certain requirements, so what do we need to do to give them it? So the customer was the investor. That's all very well, and you obviously still need to keep investors happy now because you're not going to 
you're not going to finance anything with, without investors. So investors still have to be kept happy. But for investors to get what they want, the concentration of who the customer is has to fundamentally change. And the customer of an office building now is every single person who's coming in and utilizing that, that space at an individual level, at a team level, and at a, and at a level that takes into account what are the, what are the requirements of, of, their, of their company. So the, 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 better, the better and the best flex operators are very, very deliberately and purposefully getting to understand their customers in a way that's never happened before within the, um, within the office market and then designing what it is, what it is then they need taken into account um, everybody's int uh, um, in interest in fle flexibility. And as I say, the, those those spaces are busy, and they they've got more and more demands. And places that aren't operated like that, um, uh, less so, because it fundamentally comes down down to this this point about want and need is 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 so ab absolute. How are you going to get people to want to come into a, a building? To do that, you've got to understand what can be done in our building better than anywhere else yeah because if you can't do something in your building better than anywhere else then they do it somewhere else and there's lots there's lots of you know the, I, I have this paradoxical thing with the office market i in in one on one side i'll say there's a vast amount of value destruction coming to the office market and there's a huge amount of ob obsolescence coming but i also think the best buildings operated in the right way are going to generate more revenue than they've ever done before and are going to have higher values than, than ever before. So the market, instead of being a case of, you know, when, when the market's good, we're all geniuses and when the market's bad, we're all idiots, it's going to start by bifurcating. There's going to be very successful assets and there's going to be assets that you can't, you can't give away. And so much of this is going to be down to the either the owner, the investor, or the operator understanding what can be done in my building better than better than anywhere else, and then people will come. And Anthony, conversely, by not adopting a one size fits all approach to fitting out a building, aren't, aren't the best flexible operators actually broadening up their client base? And, and some of them are serving everyone from blue chips right down to one man bands in in the same building, which is not something that was happening before. Yeah, well, the, well, that that that's very true. It used to be thought, well, well, this is this is the, um, you know, this is this is for startups or you know, one 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 man band or one one women bands. Um, but pretty pretty well, the flex market is a market for everyone now. What what you're going what you you're going to see is that this is not the this is not the end of the lease and it's not the end of a long lease, but. As a rule of thumb, a, a larger a larger company will take a much smaller base mm. and look to be operating that that space maybe like seventy percent occupant occupancy rather than fifty percent or thirty percent or whatever, and they and they they use that for very particular purposes and then they will use flexible space as, as top up for everything, but also to fit in line with their talent. So. I was talking to someone earlier about this and saying, but isn't this, you're, you're sort of suggest, suggesting that everyone's going to operate like this with this sort of flexibility. What if employees start saying, well, you've got to come back to the office. That is going to happen, but that's going to be a very dangerous game to play because it's absolutely true that your top 20%, 30% of talent is what the economists call optionality nowadays. They have options. They can go somewhere else, and they will go. So they will go, go somewhere else. So you know, it's like that old joke about, well, what if we train people and they leave? Well, what if you, what if we don't and they stay? It's going to be a bit, bit like that. The, the, the argument, the argument of kind of of companies that companies are going to, you know, particularly in a recession, they're going to start insisting everyone's going to come back. It's a, it, 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 it's a. It's an irrelevant question, frankly, because it's not it's not gonna it's not gonna it's not gonna happen. Because the better companies, if you like, the better talent 
I'm, I'm saying better purely in a you know in commercial commercial terms. They they have they have options and they have demands and and they've got to got to be got to be satisfied. So you're going to have every company from the one person to the hundred thousand, the five hundred thousand is going to use a lot of flex spaces um, for their people, but it's also going to operate their own space on exactly the same basis. Yeah. And and that that's the key thing. That's why the space as a service, just thinking about it in terms of whether it's procured a day or a month, isn't really there'd be companies taking 15 year leases, but operating their own space as if they were a flex operator. Yeah. Excellent. And then, and 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 that that's the difference there. Thanks, Anthony. That's fascinating stuff again. As uh, it really, really is an interesting and a and a fast evolving market. So let's move on to trend number four, which is resident engagement is the big leap in building energy performance. So with an increased emphasis on energy efficient buildings and the uh, much publicized rising cost of gas and electricity, there is still an unknown and an unpredictable variable in a building's performance, and that's the people who occupy it. In asset classes such as PBSA and co-living, where tenancies are typically offered on an all-inclusive basis, it's becoming apparent that resident engagement and education is becoming more and more important to change energy consumption behavior. There was a recent study um, called Changing Behaviors, which was conducted by a group of tech firms, uh, Ask for Utopy and Spike Global. And they investigated the behavior of residents living across a range of residential housing to determine how their energy use can affect net zero targets. The research revealed that 65% of millennials and 70% of Gen Z would be prepared to make major changes, not minor changes, major ones to their own lifestyles to combat climate change. And what they did as part of this study was to compare two identical student units with electric heating one of which was heated to between 18 and 22 degrees Celsius, and the other to between 25 and 30 degrees Celsius. After six months, the overheated flat used 1,670% more electricity, and that was the equivalent to an additional um, roughly 1,500 pounds, or 1.65 metric tons of carbon. So, these these people are willing to change their behaviors but in a lot of cases they do need a bit of education so there are various ways to do this um, many operators now across several asset classes are using multifunctional resident engagement apps and these can not only um, measure and and uh, display the energy energy consumption in a unit but they can also offer hints and tips uh, as to how people can reduce it and we're also seeing more and more um, appointments of actually people who can engage on a one-to-one -one basis with the residents, like community engagement officers, as we can see on this, this story here from Rendell and Rittner, who are a big um, uh, build-to-rent management company. So it's all very well having the most uh, energy efficient building in the world, but if your users are all turning up the heating to the maximum every day, then any any small gains you've made in, in the building performance is, is immediately lost. So I think over the next year or two, we're gonna see a lot of emphasis on, on education of the end user to make sure the building can come close to fulfilling its uh, energy performance uh, potential. So on to our next trend, and this is the third of our Q and A's. Um, Ian, would you like to introduce yourself quickly and then we'll, then we'll crack on with the questions. Uh, hi, good afternoon. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm Ian Murray. I'm the Senior Director of the Build to Rent Consultancy for Cortland Consult. Cortland are a US-based multifamily owner-operator. Uh, we have 85,000 apartments in the US in multifamily that we uh, own and operate, about 18 billion in capital deployed currently deploying somewhere between one and four billion in the UK, depending on which press release we're putting out. And uh, we're opening our first 500 units in Watford at the moment and building another 600 units with Reneker in uh, Manchester, multiple other deals. But I operate across the whole market. So uh, I've got quite a lot of clients outside of the Cortland uh, bubble. And uh, 
I particularly look at uh, build to rent and all the way through from sort of PBS, co living, build to rent, single family housing, and now later living as well. Excellent, thanks, Ian. So today we're going to hit. Uh, we're going to talk about single family rental, which is becoming uh, an increasingly large proportion of all new investment into build to rent in the UK. Um, the majority of what we've seen is institutional money buying existing <laughs> homes that have been um, delivered by house builders as part of a wider development and then renting them out. So while you can accurately describe them as single family rental, you can't really describe them as built to rent because they weren't initially built to rent, they were built for the, for the open sale market. But we are starting to see um, the first few schemes coming through now, which have got purpose-built, um, bespoke designed family rental homes. And what I'm interested to learn from you, um, Ian, is how you think these bespoke SFR homes are likely to differ from the standard house builder product, which has been kind of shunted across to that market in, uh, you know, up, up until now. So, I mean, single family rentals kind of probably mapping slightly behind what was the apartment market and that there was, a, you know, an initial flurry in the multifamily was residential that was designed for sale that kind of converted somewhere through the cycle into rental. And, you know, if you look into, you know, the current uh, trend is that you design them from the ground up for renting. Um, so in a similar sense, housing, you know, did follow a similar model. Um, I mean, one thing to kind of point out was that, you know, pre-pandemic, this was already becoming, um, you know, quite a focused market in the single family rental was, you know, extending the rental journey of a, of a person through their life beyond the apartment living into, into housing. But I think that the pandemic definitely accelerated the focus on single family rental because, very similar to what Anthony's saying, there's this sort of new flex of working from home meant that people are more prepared to move further out of the conurbations into a more distant commuting zone. Um, but, you know, because they're commuting less, they're able to potentially, you know, commute further. So, you know, that trend is, is very much, you know, accelerating. And I don't think there's going to be any momentum shift because the pandemic is over. I think that change has happened and people's you know desire to work from home and live in their own environment you know has you know will continue for ad infinitum now um the shift from the house builder model to a bespoke model is again very very similar to the apartment model in that you know if you're a developer you know bless them um who was developing and designing homes for sale you kind of did that once the sale was completed and off you went and, you know, onto your next project. So as long as it looked fantastic when you were selling it, it didn't really matter whether or not it lasted for a long time beyond the sales process. Mm -hmm. And in the apartment market, when the multifamily turned up, there was a whole shift in the specification and the quality of build because the period of responsibility was well extended into the ownership model. So if, um, as we all understand, ultimately these um, assets will probably end up in some institutional fund, which has got a horizon of 20 or 30 years of ownership and 20 or 30 years of income, the quality of the product has to reflect the quality or the quantity of time that you have influence over it. So the whole shift was, in the apartment market and the whole shift in the single family rental market is that, you know, because your period of ownership and your period of influence is extended beyond the PC, you now have to look at the quality of what you're buying. So, you know, taking some of the key component areas, you know, better quality kitchens. I mean, it always used to be that kitchens were pretty cheap things to buy and, and they could make them look quite well. Um, and as long as you put a branded appliance in there, on the eye, it looked like a decent kitchen. But if you really drilled down and started looking at the, you know, the quality of the carcass, the quality of the, the hinge mechanisms and the drawer mechanisms, you could start to pick holes into that quite quickly. So 
you know, the shift is that now in single family rental, because that extended ownership and life cycle is much more interest of interest, the quality of the kitchens themselves have, have massively increased. And that resonates through to bathrooms, um, mechanical electrical plant, light fittings, key, and you know, the, the ironmongery, you know, the, the whole component set for building a house has shifted in quality from that buy it cheap and sell it to buy it well so that it um, it gives you a blended life cycle. So a blended life cycle is a capital cost, an operational cost and a disposal cost. And now the whole life cost examination means that I am not focused on just the capital cost. I'm focused on the capital, the OPEX and the life cycle cost. And that extends across any component or any part of of the development. Other things that are shifting. Um, so we're looking at entire housing estates being uh, managed by a single landlord. Now they will want to have some understanding of what's going on in the individual um, houses, the same as they would in the apartment world. So sensing technology, internet of things, prop tech, you know, the provision of, you know, statewide broadband services are all going to be things that the professionally managed landlord is going to be interested in and understanding in this from a central position so you know housing within single family rental is going to have much more connectivity to the management side of it because obviously they're not being held in isolation and owned in ownership by a single pair you know um, mortgage holder so that's definitely going to happen and Things that are being influenced as a result of that are, um, you know, control mechanisms for sort of environmental, so heat, light and power and monitoring of that. But also, I think we're now starting to see a, a meal shift to ESG and things like um, zero energy housing is actually very close to becoming a reality. So, you know, the technology that's going into single family rental and frankly the probably the top the technology will translate into for sale market as well but from a single family rental perspective you can control it centrally will mean that we can almost put up for rent houses that have zero um energy requirements yeah. and then finally the model for single family rental homes over <clears throat> a traditional sales model is that if you're a single landlord and you're building 200 homes, unlike an apartment block, which is vertically and, it, and will have to be complete, all 200 apartments will have to be complete before you can start filling them up. In a, vert, in a horizontal environment, you can lease a home as soon as it's complete, the same as you would in, in a sales market. So actually your velocity of leasing and your stabilization is going to be much more um, rapid and therefore your income model is going to come towards you much more quickly than it would in a vertical environment which I think is one of the other reasons why funds are very keen on it because the cash flow and the and the rent and the income side does you know arrive much more quickly and as we know um, the income is really how the valuation of these projects is uh, is arrived at. Yeah yeah thanks Ian. Um, one of the things that multifamily housing is doing quite well um, through a combination of uh, amenities and events program programming and so on is to try and engender a sense of community in a building. H how is that going to be done, do you think, in these bespoke single family rental homes? Is it going to be, uh, is it again going to follow a similar pattern or is there a different knack to doing this? It, it's, um, <clears throat> it's going to be a very similar pattern, but again, I mean, there's going to be different typologies. So there will be single family rental models that are amenity light because they're in a low rental location, as opposed to some of the rental occasions will attract very you know, good rents and, and therefore will be able to afford a service model that sits alongside it. Traditionally, housing estates have um, formed communities much quicker than vertical apartment blocks because people become more neighborly and they, you know, they look after each other and 
they form residence associations. I mean, I have the same sort of thing where I live. Um, so that happens kind of naturally. So I think, you know, if, if you're a management company overseeing an entire estate, then what you're really trying to do is just encourage the speed of that and encourage the um, uh, that to, to, to happen and facilitate it where best as possible because, I mean, it's all about stickiness, isn't it? So if you make a, you know, if people join a cycling club or a running club or they're all playing tennis together, then they, they form bonds and relationships and those bonds and relationships stick people to a location. So, you know, and people traditionally rent houses for longer periods of time than they rent apartments they, because they're going to put their kids in school and they're going to, you know, commute to work, etc. So. I think you'll see the emergence of, you know, centralized clubhouses having kind of co-working spaces, meeting spaces, private dining spaces that you can have bigger parties in for kids or families, you know, like a community space almost for, you know, renting out for those kind of community engagement type um, events. Mugger pitches, for instance, that can be used as basketball or tennis courts or football pitches for the kids, that will happen. I mean, there are very much instances of that already. Um, M&G's um, project at Kilmwood Vale has got that at the centre of it. We used to manage that um, when we were live. Um, and, you know, if you look at Present Made, Present Made are designing properties that have got that kind of centralised hub. And I think that is going to be a trend equally like the apartment market, there will be the high and the low in terms of the rental income and the service model. And there will be projects where maybe the centralized management is really a virtual management through an engaged app. And you know you can communicate with your landlord through that, as opposed to them being physically in a building on the site. Do you think that um, these bespoke schemes, whether they're highly amenitized like present made or maybe less amenitized in a lower end area. Do you think these will eventually become the, the norm, single family rental, and that this kind of wholesale purchase of house builder units will, will be phased out? Um, well, I mean, let's not get ourselves. The house builders know how to find land and get permissions. So that trend isn't going to change. And, you know, in a declining market for house sales, they're all going to turn around and offer discount on bulk buying of houses. And there will be somebody out there who'll just, you know, go, yeah, that's fine. I'll take 200 houses off you. Um, however, I think the model will mirror the same as apartment living in that the, the change is really trying to move from the PRS market into the professionally managed BTR market. And in a similar sense, it's moving from the mom and pop landlord, single, you know, buy to let landlord ha having a house to a professionally managed service. And the expectation of the consumer is that they will have a higher expectation of service and a higher expectation of their landlords. And you will probably see, uh, you know, an emigration of, a buy to let landlords away from the market as is happening in the apartment, apartment market because the professionally managed single family market will start to erode their ability to meet those service models that uh, people are going to become accustomed to. I mean, we're living in a in a on demand world, and even if you're a you know fifty four year old millennial like myself who likes all my tech and my gadgets and my on demand, you know. I would like all of that at uh, that service level delivered to me. And the expectation is that the, that trend will only continue. Um, I mean, I think, again, there will be different service levels ac across different geographies and different locations because the service level and the rent kind of are correlating to each other. Um, but, you know, I definitely see this, uh, the trend moving from the buy-to-let market and PRS market into the professionally managed BTR and single family housing market. Yeah, excellent stuff. Thanks very much, Ian. Um, okay, let's move on to our sixth and final trend for today. And this is about NREP setting the benchmark with a self-imposed carbon tax. This is a really interesting one, I think. Um, so many of the major property companies and the major investment companies have set themselves net zero targets. Uh, Heinz, for example, has set a target of net zero operational carbon by 2040 and it will look to accomplish this by reducing emissions through renewable technologies and significantly it will be without purchasing carbon offsets um, as it says their benefits can be difficult to quantify but 2040 is, still feels like quite a long way off um, one of the problems at the heart of 
this net zero mission that everybody is on is the, the difficulty in, in defining it, in measuring it and in quantifying it. This is why what I think NREPS recently announced is, is uh, so significant and so ambitious. So NREP is a Danish based um, real estate investor. It has 18 billion euros of assets under management and it's committed to reducing embodied and operational CO2 emissions by 30 and 50% respectively by the end of next year. And it's committed to becoming entirely carbon neutral by 2028. So this is seriously, uh, seriously ambitious and involves a really major program of change throughout the company. To do this, it's in introduced an internal carbon tax to incentivize rapid and deep emission cuts. Now the internal tax, it says, will help drive innovation by putting a monetary figure on the cost of carbon to the business. According to a recent carbon pricing report from McKinsey, just 4% of companies in the real estate sector have adopted an internal carbon tax mechanism. This trails behind the energy sector where the figures at 40% and the financial services sector where it's at 28%. Now, while the general market view on the cost of quality carbon offsets is currently around the 30 euro per tonne mark, NREP will be adopting the EU trading system as its benchmark, which sets the tax at its current level of 90 euros per tonne. And this internal NREP tax um, for embodied emissions during construction will be paid as a one-off at asset completion and operational emissions generated by existing buildings will be paid annually. The revenue raised by this tax will be reinvested in projects to improve sustainability performance and to reduce emissions in the most effective science-based ways. Among the initiatives is a carbon capture program, which will combine well-established methods as well as new technologies such as direct air capture. Klaus Matheson, CEO of NREP, NREP said, humanity is facing a code red and we need action now. Targets set for 2050 or 2040 won't lead to meaningful re reductions fast enough. Um, I've got a lot of admiration for the urgency of NREP's actions. And I think that the other major real estate players will be left with little choice to follow suit. And I sincerely hope they do. Quite a serious note <laughs> to end our trends on, but um, it, it really caught my eye that um, that initiative and I think it's definitely one that uh, we're going to see more of in the years to come. So I'm just going to show you a couple of slides before we close off the session. Uh, the first session, the first webinar of next year is on a topic that we've already touched upon now but we're going to be have, taking a deeper dive into flexible living uh, and that is on the 1st of February and if you'd like to register for that you can see the link in the chat. Just a quick plug for uh, an event that we're hosting in uh, Lisbon next month, uh, 23rd and 24th of January called Recharge. If you'd like to find out more about that, you can see some information in the chat. It's a really good event. It's, um, it's capped at 100 people. It's really focused, it's really interactive and um, it, it moves around different European cities every year. So we're very much looking forward to being Lisbon and we'd like to see some of you there. If you'd like to work with us at IHM on our digital product or our live events, drop my colleague Katie a line. You can see her contact details on the screen and also in the chat. Thanks for watching today, everybody. Thanks to Lavanda for sponsoring. Uh, thanks to Fred, to Anthony and Ian for their fantastic input. Do give us a follow on those social channels that you can see there. Um, we are going to leave the session open for a couple of minutes with another countdown so you can take some notes from all the information that's in the chat. And that just leaves me to wish you all a fantastic festive period. I hope you have a wonderful time, whatever you're doing, and you come back uh, in 2023 raring to go again. Thanks very much, everybody. Take care and bye bye.